Welcome everybody. Welcome all our Torah Time viewers. So tonight we're learning Le'ilu Nishmat Avram ben Chaim Yehuda and Yecheskel ben Avraham. So tonight uh, we are, are going to speak about a very important topic and this topic is amongst the topic of Hishtadlus or Hishtadlut. Uh, the, the translation of Hishtadlus is effort, so human effort. Now the question goes like this. If God controls everything, then, and, and not only God controls everything, God is involved in every little iota of our lives, then why do we need to do anything? And if we have to do something, then what does it mean that God controls everything? These things, uh, th these two concepts sort of contradict each other. So we have to understand the, the, the fine line between them. And, and a person also has to think that now if I have to make my heshtadlus, my effort, then now how much effort do I need to make? So these are a lot of questions that come up. This, uh, you know, emuna is a very nice topic. It's a nice fluffy topic that everybody's like, okay, emuna, everything is for the best, which is true. Everything is for the best. But then when it comes down to like the, the actions of what you need to do, the question is, where do we, where do we stand? Now, this topic will be a, uh, one class is not going to suffice for this. We're going to actually do a mini-series in our Imuna series on this topic of Hishtadlis. So we're going to be Zat Hashem speak about, you know, how much effort a person needs to make, how do you know how much effort, what's the difference between effort and uh, negligence. There are many different aspects that we need to uh, get through. So this is the first one in this, uh, in this mini-series. Now, the idea of emuna, faith, is something that's not new to Judaism. It's something, faith in fact comes naturally to people. To, I, I know faith in God may be a little bit far-fetched for the majority of people, especially for the people that don't believe in God, but everybody has faith in something. And then the, the, uh, the idea is like this. So let's say you're about to go on a plane. You have faith that the pilot knows how to fly, that the engineers checked out the plane beforehand, that they put enough fuel in the, in, in the plane. You have faith in this. When you go and you put a piece of food in your mouth, you have faith that this food is not poisonous. <laughs> you have faith that this food is not even spoiled. You have faith that this food is, let's say, kosher if you're eating in a kosher restaurant. So there's many things that we have uh, you know, faith on. And, you know, some people have faith in themselves, some people have faith in other people, some, many people have faith in God. So the concept of faith is very, very normal to our day-to-day -day lives. But when we actually break it down, the concept of faith is not always a good thing. And I want to give you some few examples, and obviously these examples are going to be from far, far left field, but that's just to show you the, the concept of faith and how far reaching it goes. There is um, a festival in, um, in India uh, and I'll be honest, a lot of these things that we're going to say is, is from India. The Bani festival is where hundreds of people, you know, come to a certain temple and they hit each other on their head at midnight. Directly at midnight, this is to commemorate the killing of a demon, and they go and they hit each other on the head. And this is their faith, this is their belief of what they have. There's also another, um, I don't want to say minhag, but it's another uh, belief that they have is that uh, as a different sect of people that they go and they have a very, very strong bond with snakes. And there is a certain, you know, the fifth day of a certain month, they celebrate it that they take live cobras, these live poisonous snakes, and they don't even take out their venoms or their fangs, meaning that they're still poisonous and they worship them. And how do they worship them? They feed them milk, they feed them rats, and they believe, the worshippers believe with emuna, with full faith, that the snakes do not bite on this particular holiday. So they have faith. They have faith in something else. You have, there's, there's something that's unbelievable. This is a practice that's uh, held by many years by both Hindus and Muslims in, uh, in India, that it's called baby tossing, where they take babies and they drop them off from heights of above 50 feet. And there's a bunch of people uh, surrounding at the bottom with a blanket and they sort of catch the baby. And they believe, they have emuna. they believe that this brings them prosperity. This brings them this, uh, this prosperity to their family. Happens to be that whoever is nervous about this, the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights is investigating these cases, but these things uh, still, still exist. The, there is a certain um, sect in the, the, in the Banaras that they, what they do is that they, the way that they connect to God is they eat human remains after cremation. Uh, there's also another one, in case you guys haven't figured it out yet, there's cows that are sacred, we know, in Hindus. There's a certain village in Maharashtra that what they do is, is that they decorate the cows, and then the people, the villagers, lay down on the floor, and then they allow the cows to walk over them. 
And, and by the way, when a cow walks over and you, that's not a massage. That's not like, oh yeah, you get this spot over there. I got a, you know, a little knot over there. When a cow, which is very, very big. I don't know if you've ever seen a cow in real life. They're huge. When it walks over, you, it like crushes you. And they trample over the people. And they believe, the Ave Muna, that this will move the gods to answering their prayers. So, uh, and by the way, this doesn't go only to like religion aspects. It was a famous Raja, a prince, uh, who, uh, who died and left behind 2,000 wives. And these 2,000 window, w widows, they consented to be burnt alive on their dead husband's funeral as a sign of their faith to this person. Uh, uh, you know, so I mean, I have actually quite a few lists over here, but I think we get the point over here that faith in itself is not always a good thing. And you would think, okay, Faith in, like, emuna, in other weird, obstructive, something that we can't understand, something that we can't comprehend in this Far East types of religions, these things that sound very wacky, that's fine. Okay, now we don't understand, but come on, like us, we have faith, and we're, like, normal, and our faith is normal. And says Rabbi Victor Miller, that no, you could even have an Orthodox observant Jew that follows the Tarsha Bechsav, Tarsha Baal Pet, that follows the Shulchan Aruch, follows everything, and they still have a wrong kind of faith. And one example of that is something called too much faith. This can also be an error, says Rabbi Victor Miller. A person could go and can be convinced that everything is from God. Everything is Yad Hashem. Everything is from Min Hashem. So what does he do? He leans back. She leans back, relax, you know, enjoys, enjoys the, the, themselves without making any attempts on their own. This person, says Rabbi Victor Miller, is very, very guilty of a very great error. It's something called too much bitachon. There's something that's called too much bitachon. Meaning that anything that we do, we, we use our actions. We don't just have faith. You look at an example of, let's say you're about to eat a meal. So you see there, there's a beautiful meal in front of you, the delicious food, worthy of pictures and posting on all social media for whatever. And this food is, is placed, and then you go and you say, you know what? I have faith that God will nourish me without me having to chew or eat anything. Now, this person is, you know, a little bit uh, missing some screws up there. There's, what do you mean you, you're, you're not you're going to sit over there and have God have faith? You have to put it in your mouth at least. And not only you have to pull it and put it in your mouth, you realize even the effort that you're doing, even that has, there's, some of the times it's very significant. You want to chew something, so you bite something from your, from your front teeth. Then the tongue has to go and propel it to the back, to the molars, where, where it, you know, it's able to grind it. The saliva makes these certain secretions to help it digest it in the mouth and to help it go down the esophagus to lubricate it for swallowing. There's so many things that have to go down even for something so simple as eating. The, um, imagine you have somebody who is a big Talmud Chacham, sits and learns all day. And he prays to God that he wants to get married. He prays, he prays, he does everything right to get married except for one thing. He doesn't go on any dates. Now this person obviously uses, you know, like there's no way, like you could pray from today to tomorrow, you're not going on any dates, you're not going to find a, you know, a wife over here. Uh, but imagine he goes and he prays now that he should have children, without even finding a wife. So this is not going to happen despite all the prayers, meaning, says Rabbi Victor Miller, there are, there are limits to bitachon, there are limits to emunah, something that's very, very important. There is a fine line of where we have to stand. The, you know, you can't be this like, uh, you know, such a high level of emunah that you're just going to cross the street, cross the highway with closing your eyes. That's foolish. This is something that we spoke about, you know, beginning of uh, coronavirus. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm going to do this. I have a munah that I'm not going to get sick. What do you mean you have a munah? You can't be sick. You have to protect yourself. You have to do the things that you need to do to protect yourself. There is something called in this world, we have to have effort. We have to put in ourselves in a, in a situation to do actually things, not just to sit back and, and uh, let things fall into our laps, which granted, it does sometimes happen. There is also a confusion with a fearfulness, with somebody being scared and trust and emunah. Many people, let's say, would, would, would uh, let's use medical as an example. They don't want to go to a doctor to see certain results. Or maybe, yeah, they don't want to go to surgery. They're going to claim, they're going to say, you know what, I have emunah that I don't need to, uh, I don't need to check on this. And so what do you mean you have emunah? That's not, nothing to do with emunah. That means that you're scared. Some people don't want to check their blood for how they're doing. I have emunah, you know, like, uh, what do you mean have emunah? That means that either you're scared, or you're following the Torah. The Torah says that you have to go and follow your, you got, you know, the health guidelines that you need to do. So sometimes people use emunah b'techon as sort of an excuse to get out of something that they don't want to do. And this goes way over the top for people that are lazy. Sometimes you have somebody that's very lazy. So what they say, and they claim, they be like, why? I don't have to do anything. In the time of the man, when the man fell from heaven, he says, so too for me, everything will fall from heaven. He says, 
But is it the reason that you have that level of trust? Or maybe you're just too lazy and you're using that as an excuse to make yourself feel better that you don't have to do more effort because you're too lazy. So there's a lot of times where Munah goes and is the usage of basically a excuse for you to getting what you want. Rabbi Dessler also goes on and says that, that, that just in the concept of laziness, the concept of laziness, this is something that pervades all of a person's ways. Like, you're not usually lazy in just one area. If you're lazy, you're lazy in all areas. Yes, sometimes, some places you're not going to be so lazy, but it's sort of, it's like a, it's like a virus that spreads everywhere. And the, Rabbi Dessler goes on and says that it's better to increase your hishtadlut, your effort, and that will cause you to have maybe a little bit of a lower level of emunah because you're doing more, you're doing more hishtadlut, but now what's going to happen is, is that now you're going to be doing more hishtadlut, so now you're going to take away your laziness. Now that's going to affect also your spiritual laziness. So that, if Rabbi Dessler goes and says that something that like laziness, it's preferable to be hardworking despite the fact that you need to increase your natural effort in things. Because now that you're increasing your effort, you're also going to increase your effort in divine services in the spiritual pursuits as, you know, as well. So now, we have to understand why do we even need effort? Why do we even need to do Hishtadut? We know that before Adam HaRishon made the sin of the Etzadas, the, the, the tree, the sin of the tree, he didn't need to do any effort. He had to sit down. His focus was all spiritual. Then only after the sin, he, has to, he had to go and, and do uh, effort, which we'll soon speak about in, in more depth. It says the Chavot Halvavot in Shara Bitachon. And it says it gives us two reasons of why we need to have Emunah, and why do we, we need to have Ishtadut. It says one of them, is something called Bechina, something that is called testing. God uses um, this sort of to, to test us. What, what do I mean by that? So every aspect of our lives is governed by certain rules and regulations. Now, people could go and say, you know what, why this is, it seems like God is like, what is that called, a helicopter mother? Or like hovering over anything? Like why does God care so much about everything that we have to do? Just leave me alone for a second. But what we don't realize is that that is the greatest blessing. Because what happens is that we have a lot of things that we do in our, in our day-to-day lives that are maybe not learning Torah, that are maybe not following the Torah to all aspects of like doing mitzvot. It's going to work, for, is an example. Now, God made certain rules and regulations that even at work you have to follow. So we say, people go get overwhelmed, be like, why are you doing this to me? Why are you hovering over this as well? And the answer is that everything that we do, and we're following the Torah, we get credit. So meaning that you're looking at it as a bad thing, this is the greatest thing possible, because now God gave you the ability to get reward, to get credit for something that you have to do anyways. So when somebody has to go to work, when somebody has to do the hishtadlu to get the panasa, what's happening is over here, now this is the test. What's the test? Are you going to follow the Torah or are you going to go and skip a little corners over here, skim a little bit over here? Are you going to be tempted to transgress this halakha? Are you going to go around this thing? Are you going to badmouth your competitor? Are you going to go and raise your prices more than you need to? There's so many different things that you could go and, and, and you could try to make more money. But that's when you don't have the emunah. And this is where it sort of comes in together. So what it shows us over here, number one, is why do we need to have Ishtadlut? And that is because it's a test. It's a test to see if we will follow God in all areas. That's number one. The second one, says the Chavot al is Yigiyah, toil. The, when someone's busy, they are kept out of trouble. When I was in, um, when I was in elementary, I remember we had a kid, that um, a classmate of mine, that was, was very hot-tempered, like crazy hot-tempered, like somebody that you feel, you know, should be smoking 35 packs a day. Like so he was always hot-headed. And he also, you know, because of that, you know, something went a little bit off. He like, you know, blew up and he caused like, you know, issues in the classroom. So I remember the, the rabbi would go, my rabbi would go and be like, Every time that he would have some sort of outburst, he would say, he would go to him and says, you know what, can you do me a favor? Can you go down to the basement and check if the hot water is working? He gave him this mission like numerous times a day. He's like, yeah, just check again. I'm not sure. And this kid had a mission. He's like, okay, let me go check. And he would go out and he would check and he would, you know, to, to see if the hot water is working in the basement. Now, why did the rabbi do it? Number one is to get him out of the class probably. But number two, when you're all emotionally involved in your own head, if you are, are just stuck in your own thoughts, then you don't have the ability to, to sort of calm yourself down because you're sort of like in your own world. But if you're doing something else, then you can't be in your own situation, you can't be in your own thoughts. So you sort of like, when you keep busy, that's why when people have certain desires, certain temptations, that's very hard for them to overcome. One of the most important aspects is to keep busy. Because when you're bored, 
then you're gonna have all these desires, all these temptations come up. But if you're busy, then you're not gonna have time to speak Lashon Allah. If you're busy, you're not gonna have time to look at improper things. If you're busy, you're not gonna be able, you're not gonna have you know, the, the time to use, let's say, a foul language. So what happens is, is that God made us have this, this opportunity called Hishtatutu effort. And why is it that we have to do effort in our medical? We have to do effort in our work and upon us. We have to do effort in our marriage. We have to do effort in all areas. This is keeping us busy in all areas. And we're keeping busy in all areas. Then all of a sudden, we, we don't have the time to do any sins. So it sort of keeps us preoccupied and prevents us from, uh, from sinning. That, says the Chalavot, is reason number two. So reason number one is a test to see how you will live your life, to see if you're going to follow the Torah. Test number, reason number two is, is the toil. When you're busy, you're not going to be able, you're not going to come into uh, falling into, into sin. The Gemara Kiddushim, page 82b, says, Rabbi Shem ben Allah says that something that's very common and very famous. He, he goes and he says, you know, you've never seen a deer work as a job. You've never seen a deer dry figs in the field trying to sell it. You never see a lion work as a janitor. You never see all these animals, they don't have jobs. They find where they need to sleep, they eat what they need to eat, and they go on and they live with life. Says the Gemara over there, says, all these animals, what were they created? They, they're, they're created for meat, and they're sustained without pain. So doesn't it make sense that I too should be sustained without any pain? But says the Gemara goes on and says, but what happened? But I corrupted my doings, I made my sins, and because of that I was deprived of my sustenance. And this is what the first curse was of Adam HaRishon. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 19 it says, God cursed, of the, the, the curse of, of Adam HaRishon is now, by the sweat of your brow you're going to have to eat bread. Now we got punished that we have to now do this extra hishtadut, and not, not a simple, it's the sweat of the brow, it's hard work, in order to gain our, uh, to gain our bread. The Pasuk in Eov, chapter 5, verse 7, says, Adam l'amal yolad. A person is created, is born to toil. Meaning that you're not born here to sit on the beach in Bahamas and relax. You're born here to toil. But says the Yalkut Shemani, the Midrash says in Bereshit, it says, Ashrei mi shema'alo b'Torah. Fortunate is one who toil in Torah. Meaning that what? That you have to toil in something. Now the question is, where are you going to put that toil? Are you going to put yourself in that toil in the need of, of, of Torah, or are you going to put it in other pursuits? At the end of the day, you're going to have to toil. But praiseworthy is the one that puts their pursuit, puts their, puts their toil into the Torah. Now based upon this, the Chavavot Havavot brings down a very, very important principle. He says that if there's any specific individual that proves that these two re reasons which is what? Which is that he needs to have the, the Hishtadut for, for reason of either test to see if he'll follow the Torah or toil so that he won't have a time to do any sins. But if somebody goes and he has, she shows or she shows that these reasons do not apply to them, then what's happened over there? They're released from the need to do the extra hishtadlut for themselves. Meaning that if he goes and he shows or she shows that he's devoted to the sincere service of the Baranah Shalalam, their, 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 their service to God is so devoted that it doesn't matter. They don't require the tests as the rest of mankind. And number two, they also show that even when they're calm and when they have the free time, they're not falling into sin. They're, not, they're enjoying their tranquil life by doing the mitzvot, by learning more Torah. So by doing that, that all of a sudden releases the need to have so much ishtadlut. Gives us a little trick on how to get less ishtadlut over here. Very important. If you follow the Torah, you have to do less. If you really, really follow it. Another reason the Mechtav Melial goes and says that if, let's say, you would just pray for, let's say, money, and money would fall down from heaven, then there won't be a test. So in order for there to be a test, there has to be the hishtadlut aspect as well. And the Sifri says in Devarim, chapter 15, verse 18, it says, mm -hmm. And God goes and blesses you in everything that you do. It says the Sifri over here. But what happens if someone doesn't do anything? Is he still blessed? Says it's a free answer. No, it says from here, it says, Bechol and everything that you do, you're only blessed in something that you do. And the Tanit Ve'aliya also brings out another port, uh, a source for this. Devarim chapter 14, verse 29. It says, God will bless you in everything that you will do. Meaning that if you act, if you do, you will be blessed. But if you do not act, then you will not be blessed. And we can see this in numerous places, places throughout the Torah. In Shemot chapter 2, verse 5. We know the famous story of Pharaoh's daughter, Basia, when she goes and she sees Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu was sitting over there on the Nile River. And we know that he was, she was very far away. And what did she do? She stretched out her hand. Now the questions that, people, that all the Mephalshim, all the commentators ask, why is she stretching out her hand? If let's say you want to go and you want to grab something, and that something is 100 feet away, 
Are you gonna just stretch? Like maybe I can reach it? Like what are you talking about? There's like no way you won't even stretch. You'll, maybe you'll walk or maybe you'll give up on it depending how lazy you are. But the, the, you're for sure not gonna stretch out your hand to see if you could uh, make it move. So what was Pyro's daughter doing? And the answer is that even when God performs a miracle, even that, the person first required to make an effort. Meaning there had to be some sort of effort going on over there, and from that effort, the miracle came. In Melachim, it says the prophet Ovadia's wife, the story of that, the famous story with, uh, with Elisha, what happened was King Ahav came to her and wanted to take her sons as a slaves for an unpaid debt. And she came over crying to Elisha and says, you know, your, your servant, which is her husband, my husband is dead now. And he doesn't have, she doesn't have the need to go and, and pay out the debt. And because of that, now they want to take her two, her two sons for slaves. So Elisha goes over to her and says, tell me, what do you have in your house? And she says, I have nothing except the jar of oil. So Elisha goes over there and says, okay, you take that jar of oil, put it on the side. Now you gather all vessels, make sure they're empty. Empty vessels, empty, empty utensils, and put as much as you can in your house. And then you start pouring, and you start pouring, and you start pouring. And she says, okay, fine. The prophet says that, that's what I'm going to do. She goes home. She gathers all her neighbor's empty vessels, all her other, every container she could put her, get, find her hands, and she brought, she took. And she started taking the jar of oil, and she started pouring. And the oil kept on pouring, and it kept on filling up every vessel that she had in her house. Until finally, she filled up all of them. She goes over to her children and says, Good, bring, bring, me more, bring me some more containers. And they're like, there's no, more, there's no more containers. And then the oil stopped. So we see over here that even when the prophet brings upon a miracle, that the oil multiplies from the blessing, there was, there was one jar that it just kept on pouring and pouring. They say this also by the Baba Sali, that he also had a bottle and it just kept on pouring and pouring. He used to cover it with, a, with like a scarf and he used to just keep on pouring. But what happens when the person is just sitting back and not doing anything. The jar would have just stayed there. Oh, maybe it would have been, the, the, the woman had to go and she had to pour. She had to do something in order to, to grab onto that, to that miracle. The Medrash also brings another story of Rabbi Hanina, who wanted to give something to the Bet Midrash. He, I'm sorry, the Bet Beis uh, He wanted to give something. And the problem was, is that he wanted to donate something, but he didn't have any, any money. He was poor, he was impoverished. He didn't have any, he couldn't afford to do anything. So one day while he was walking, he saw this impressive looking stone. And he felt, he said, you know what, this stone would be very, very good to put into the, into the temple, into the Bet HaMikdash. But the problem was, it's a very large and heavy stone. And it would be impossible for him by himself to carry it all the way to, to Jerusalem, to Yerushalayim. So he tried to go and, and hire people to go and carry it to, to Yerushalayim. But the problem was, is that people gave them, it was a heavy stone. People gave him a crazy amount of money that it would cost to, to bring it there. So he wasn't sure what he was going to do. At that moment, all of a sudden, five workers came by. And they told him that they will go and they will transport the stone for him on one condition. Doesn't have to pay them, doesn't, they weren't asking for money. The one condition that he has to put his hands under the stone and help them lift it. And he says, okay, fine. He puts his hands under the stone. He helps them lift it. And as he helps them lift it, he looks up and a miracle, he's in Yerushalayim. He's sitting over there in Jerusalem. Says the Midrash, he says, what happened over here? These were angels. They, God saw how much he wanted to donate so badly. He wanted to go, and so God get, put the stone over there and put it in a situation where the angels will come and help him transport that stone into Yerushalayim. But the question is, so why, why did he have to go and, and put his hands under it? Why can't they just transport it to Yerushalayim? And the answer is because he had to do something. There is a concept that you have to do, he shall do it. You have to do something. It's very important to know a very fundamental principle that we've been speaking for the past who knows how many classes that God runs the show. Everything in our life comes from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Everything is from God. Everything. But He also wishes us to be involved. And it's very interesting. That's how the spiritual work is, is also. We also have to be involved. We have to, have, we have to put our efforts. And those efforts will then be blessed. But now we, so now we understand that we have to do effort. You have to do you know, physical effort. Well, people forget sometimes. The, one of the most important things is that effort is not only in the physical aspect of, for example, going and working. There's also spiritual effort. There's also spiritual hishtadlut. The most famous spiritual hishtadlut is something called prayer. Tfilah. The Mishnah in Kiddushin goes and says our mayor would, sit, would teach that a person should always teach his son clean and easy profession. Hishtadlut. He has to work. But then goes on and says, but and he should pray to the one of the man who is the master of the riches and property, the one who owns everything, he should pray to God. Why? 
because there's no profession without poverty and riches. Meaning that there's no, you think you'll take a certain job and this job makes a lot of money. No. There's a certain people on that job that make a lot of money and there's certain people on that job that make a little money. And the, you take another job where people, let's say, it seems like people don't make any money and people are millionaires from it. And I could list you off examples. You, could look, you have doctors and lawyers, which is a very you know, obvious profession that people choose to for you know, more a, of a lucrative profession. And I've known doctors and lawyers that can barely make ends meet. And yet you had people that, let's say they did get into a profession, right? So they go into some sort of, I don't know, a, a lower profession, pick your choice. I don't want to use an example because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But let's say you pick a lower professional that doesn't, let's say makes only, you know, a quarter of what a lawyer makes. There are people like these that I've met that are making 10 times what a doctor would make. Yes, they ended up getting into their own business and what so on and whatnot, but the, the, the profession itself doesn't bring you the panasa. God gives you the panasa. And everything depends on that person's merit. So what does this Mishnah say in Kiddushim? That a person should go and should do the Yishadut. You should learn a profession. You have to learn to do your work, to do uh, something that will help to bring you the Panasa. But at the same point in time, that's only one part of the sentence. The second part of the sentence is that you have to pray to God who gives the Panasa. But that's one part of the Yishadut, the spiritual Yishadut. There's another part, part number two, and that is mitzvot. There's a, the Gemara and Shabbat. Page 23b says that somebody who is careful in the mitzvah of mezuzah will merit to have a beautiful home. There are some people that they go and they buy a beautiful house. And then when it comes to buying mezuzah, they're like, okay, you know, the mezuzah is uh, $70. Be like, listen, you know, Rabbi, can you, you know, you get something, you know, like uh, a little bit cheaper? And uh, he says, okay, you know, there's something that's like $50, but, you know, it's still good. It's not the best. He's like, yeah, but like, what's just kosher? says, okay, I can get you something for $40, but let's like, it's like really, really boring. Like, yeah, I'll take that. And what does he have to take that? He has to take, you know, 70 mezuzot for the entire mansion. He spent, you know, $10 million on the home, but could only spend $1,000 on the mezuzot. The Gemara tells us that if you're careful with the mitzvah of mezuzah, you will merit having a beautiful home. This is, there's other hishtadlut, there's spiritual hishtadlut. There's also with tzitzit. If somebody's careful with the mitzvah of tzitzit, they will merit having nice clothing. The Gemara further says if you're careful with the mitzvah of kiddush, you will have, you'll be able to afford abundance of wine. The way that God works is midah k'nek midah, measure for measure. The Gemara on Rosh Hashanah 16a also tells us that why do we do nisuch haman? We do water libations on Sukkot. Why? Because that's when we're judged for rain. So now we're doing a mitzvah when we're judged for rain to get, gain us that merit. We, br we bring a barley offering on Pesach, a carbon omer. Why? Because we're judged for grain during that time. So God works measure for measure. So just like we do physical ishtadlut, we also need to do the spiritual ishtadlut. You look at, the, if, let's say for example, charity. The Gemara Bava Batra, page 10a, goes and says that Keshem Shemizunotav Shel Adam Kitsuvim Lom Rosh Hashanah Just like a person's um, panasa, a person's um, money, his financial income for that year is decreed on Rosh Hashanah, Kach so too Chesre Noisav, the, the, the losses so to the losses are there are also decreed on Rosh Hashanah, meaning that a person have, you have your, 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 how much you'll earn and how much you'll lose on Rosh Hashanah. Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai once had a dream, and in the dream his nephews would lose 700 dinarim that year. So he tried to convince them to donate money to charity. And they ended up, throughout the entire year, he kept on saying, okay, donate more money here, donate more money here. At the end of the year, they ended up donating 683 dinarim. On Erev Yom Kippur, the Roman authorities come and they seize 17 dinarim from the nephews. So when they come to Rabbi Yochanan and they say, you know, the, the government, you know, went and they seized 17, they seized, they, they didn't say how much, they said they seized our, our uh, money, they took away some money from us, and he's like, yeah, don't worry, it's only going to be 17 and there's nothing more. And he's like, wait a minute, how do you know that it's going to be 17 dinarim? How do you know that that was a number? And he explained to him about the dream that he had that they would lose 700 dinarim that year. So that's why he went and he convinced them to, instead of losing the money to the government to pay taxes, to pay who knows what, rather go and give it to charity. And they ended up donating 683. You take 700 minus 683. You're left with the 17 dinar. He says, that's how I knew how much you guys uh, had to pay. So they asked him, he says, I don't understand, my dear uncle, Rabbi, how come you didn't tell us to donate the whole 700? Where did you give the whole 700? 
So he says, I wanted you to give that money sincerely. I wanted to give you that, to make sure that you give that, that amount of charity with, with the right kavanot, with the right, with the right mindset. Meaning that we see over here that sometimes there is something that has decreed certain losses and we could do certain spiritual hishtadlut that will prevent us from having those losses. And one of that is, is tzedakah. Charity. People don't realize that they think that they're doing charity, they're helping the other person. But in essence, they're really helping themselves. They're really helping themselves. When you go, and you, it, in order to, to like try to like put that into your own mindset, think about it this way. The next time you give charity, you say thank you to the other person. Granted, depending on who, some of the guy might ask you for more money. But you should, because you're, you're getting more than he's getting. Rabbi Melech Biederman brings down a story that happened a few years ago in El Israel. There was a wealthy man by the name of Yaakov Halpern, and he had this affinity, he had this liking towards uh, expensive watches. And one time he, wanted, he made a custom-made watch that, would, that costed more than 200,000 shekels. You're talking about a little bit, uh, a little bit under $60,000. And uh, it took, you know, like three or four months until it actually like was developed and, you know, whatever made. And one day he gets a phone call, and he, got, he, put, the, he put the money on the side so that when the watch is ready, he'll be able to go and pay for it. The day that the watch is ready, he gets a phone call and he says, you know, the watch is ready. Are you, uh, do you want to come pick it up? And he says, uh, yeah, I'm out of town now. I'll, you know, I'll be out for a few days. When I come back, I'm going to come to your store and I'll pick it up. A few hours later, after he got this phone call, he gets, somebody else calls him up and he tells him about there's a certain family in Bnei Brak that the entire house burned down. And not only the house burned down, the entire possessions were lost for it. So now the community was trying to raise three, four hundred thousand shekels to, you know, to be able to put this family back on their feet. So they go over to him. They knew this person, Yaakov Halpin, was a wealthy person. He says, maybe you can help this family, you know, with a sizable donation. So, you know, he was thinking, he's like, you know, all his money was, all his other money was tied up. But he did have this two hundred thousand shekels sitting over here. But at one, po at mo at one point, he's thinking, you know, I already pre-ordered this watch. I can't just back out of it. But another point is, how am I going to go and enjoy this watch, this luxurious item, when somebody doesn't have a house over their head, when they don't even have clothes on their back? How could I enjoy it? So he tells the call, he says, you know, let me, let me make a phone call and I'll get back to you. He calls up the watch dealer and he says, uh, listen, you know, something came up. Is it bad for you if I back out? So the watch dealer says, you know, it happens to be that, you know, there's numerous other people that are also waiting for this watch, this type of watch. There's a waiting list for it. If, it's, if you don't want it, I'll sell it you know, tomorrow. So he goes and says, you know what, sell it tomorrow and I'll pre-order another one. I'm, I'm putting my money in a different, uh, a different use now. And he calls back this other person and says, I want to donate 200,000 shekels to this family of Nebrak. And that was the end or so to speak of that story. Three years go by. And one Thursday night on November 24th, there were over 600 fires. The apartments, buildings were destroyed and the fire spread to a moshav called Bes Meir. This moshav Bes Meir is about 15 minutes away from Yerushalayim. In this particular moshav, Yaakov Halpern owns a very, very large estate and he happened to have his son staying on the property. And while the fires were raging and it was, it was running, he had to go and you know, escape to a different place uh, and come back to see once the fires were taken out. He ran out that Thursday, he came back Friday before Shabbat to see the damage. He looks at it and he sees that the house next door to the Halperns was completely destroyed. But the fire never crossed the property. The, not even they planted new trees, the trees themselves didn't even get singed. It, it's sort of like it just stopped right on the property line. This Yaakov Halpern, he not only did he do his regular Ishtadlut in working in business and he was successful, but he also did a spiritual Ishtadlut. Meaning that he also went and God works midah, kenagi midah. He went and he helped another family in a need when there was a fire. So too when he, when there was a, need, there was a fire in his area, he wasn't affected by it. That it's, sometimes it's not only about putting this earthly Ishtadlut. It's also about putting our spiritual Ishtadlut. That's number two. Number three, in the spiritual aspect, is our actions. There was a woman who went over to Rabbi David Asher and uh, told her of this story, that there was a person who was, uh, that was dating, it was a girl that was dating, and the father was setting up the dates. And the father was unaware that this daughter very, very much strongly opposed to marrying anybody with the same name as her father, which was Asher. She didn't want to, she didn't want to marry somebody with the same name as her father. 
So the father didn't, you know, wasn't aware of that she held so strongly on this. And, you know, they ha the father happened to agree for them to go out for a certain boy whose name was Usher. And when she found out, she said she didn't want to meet him. She says, there's no point. I'm not going to marry him. So but the father went and explained, you know, like, if we would cancel the meeting, you know, it's going to hurt the other boy's side. We already said yes. Now we're backing out. They're going to think something is wrong. It's, you know, it's going to hurt the other, um, the other side. So the girl decided, uh, fine, you know what, I'll go out with him, but it's not going to happen. And she even told this to the Shatkan. He says, listen, I I'm going out with this boy, but, like, I it's not going to happen because he has the same name as my father. And the Shatkan said, fine. That same day that she agreed to go out, another, a different Shatkan calls up and offers this girl another suggestion. And the father knew that even though his daughter is going out on a date now, but she knew it's not going to happen anything, and this other suggestion looked good, and so the father accepted the offer. It was a good boy from a good family, everything was top of the line. And they scheduled this date for like next week. She said, you know, she's busy, she's not able to schedule it for next week. Meanwhile, this girl went on the date with the first boy, and the family of the second boy saw her dating another guy. And they're like, what? You just said like a few hours ago, yes to us. Why are you dating somebody else? And they called off the, they called off the entire uh, shidduch. They said they're not interested. And the, the, you know, the father called the shatchan and tried to explain the situation. The shatchan called the family and said, listen, you don't understand. She was, you know, she's only dating this guy because she felt bad. She didn't want to hurt his feeling. The family did not accept it. it was not, they were not interested. They were uh, you know, very upset about the whole situation and wanted to move on. Now this daughter, she was very, you know, pained by the fact that she, her decision to make, to do something nice, now she lost out on a good boy. And over the next several months, she goes out, dates, all of them, not shaykh, not, nothing that was working out. Until one day, they receive a phone call from Mishat Khan, and they tell him about this unbelievable boy, like from the top of the top, like there are lines and lines that people are waiting in line for that. And this boy just got into the Shaduchim. And the family comes from a well, very well-to-do family. They said they have the most important quality. They're not going to budge on it. And this is what they're looking for in a girl. They want somebody who is ex exceptionally compassionate and sensitive. That's what they're looking for for their son. So the Shatran hears this. She immediately thinks of this girl. And the Shatran tells over this uh, story to, this, uh, to, this, to the parents. said, listen, you know, there's a certain girl might not come from the same level of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, let's call it financial status as your family, but a very good girl. And he tells him, says, you know, she was going to go out with somebody, but then she found out it's the name of the, of the father, and she didn't want to hurt the other boy's feelings. She went out just for that. And they were very impressed with that. So they decided that they're going to, you know, they're going to, out of all the people that they got read, that they got set up with, they decided they're going to go with this girl. And what happened, this girl ended up getting married to this, uh, you know, to this, uh, to this boy. And many times in life, we hear these like crazy stories. Like it just so happened to be that she was in such a situation, you were in such a situation, and because of that, you found your spouse, and because of that, you found your business, and because of that, you found your doctor, and because of this, you found this, and because of that, we have these crazy stories. Right place, right time, right, you know, said the right thing. We put all our efforts into this like, we just happened to get it. And what we don't realize is that in order to get to those situations, to those places, to the pl right place in the right time, we had to do something. Something had to happen generally. We had to have some sort of merit. We did some sort of spiritual hishtadlut. It's not that things just fall. There's, God orchestrates everything. And when God orchestrates everything, there's a rhyme or reason for everything. And when we do our spiritual hishtadlut, God will make it all so that things will fall into place. Many people are very, very, you know, stuck when they do the ishtadlut. They focus just on the physical aspect. It's not just on the physical aspect. It's also on the spiritual aspect as well. There was a certain rabbi that uh, was asked to be a guest speaker to go away for a certain uh, Shabbat to, to be a guest speaker at, at a Shabbaton. And, you know, he had to leave the tequila, his congregation, he didn't really want to, but he decided, you know what, you know, it felt like this was the right thing to do, and he went and he, and he did that. Meanwhile, he met somebody while he's on the Shabbaton, and, you know, he was just, you know, speaking to him, and, and this, this guest knew that the rabbi was, and his congregation was involved in, in this uh, large, uh, you know, like, uh, a construction project, that they're building a beautiful synagogue, so the, the guy says, you know, what's going on, how is it going with, uh, with the construction? And the rabbi says, you know, it's good, uh, but uh, he says, we're coming in sort of a snag. Now we, it's going to cost us almost a million dollars extra. And he says, why? Why do you need it? And he says, you know, there's a certain problem with the soil, there's a certain problem with this. We, ha we have certain issues. And he says, yeah, but that doesn't make sense. With those issues, you don't need that much, you know, it shouldn't cost you that much. 
And the rabbi goes to him and says, you know, how do you know? And it just so happens to be that this, is, this person that they were speaking to was one of the leading en engineers in the United States, and he's working on over a $600 million project. And he was a specialist in this area. And the guy says, you know, like, let me reach out to you after Shabbat. Let me review your, what your contractor says. Something doesn't make sense. And he ended up saving the rabbi and the congregation over $700,000. So what happens is, is that sometimes the rabbi was going to do, it, it, you know, his regular, you know, speeches. Nothing to do with his congregation. But that counted as some sort of spiritual hishtadut. He did something that he thought he was doing for himself. And because he was doing it for himself, it ended up that he ended up gaining in some other area. And this is very much connected to the class we spoke about last week. The class we spoke about last week is you never ever lose out by doing, by doing for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because when you do for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you open yourself this, this spiritual bitachon, this spiritual hishtadut that you're doing over here. Meaning that you're creating an opportunity for you to happen in the future. So, so important that when we do things, we have to realize there's also spiritual aspects that we have to focus on. There's also a spiritual hishtadut that we have to do. Besides the prayer, we have the mitzvot, we have the extra merits that we can have that will bring us what we want, what we desire. Because when we do our efforts, why are we doing our efforts? To get something that we want. Whether it's marriage, whether it's children, whether it's panasa, whether it's health, there's so many different things. But don't only get caught up with only the hishtalut in this world. You also have to do the hishtalut in the spiritual aspect. And the, the, the Ramchal goes and says that, you know, when you balance you know, this thing of the, let's say you call it the two different type of, of hishtadut, the spiritual and the physical. He says, what, what, should you do, what should you put more focus on? He says, what, how do the people that were the tzaddikim, they made the Torah study, the spiritual bitachon, that was their principal occupation. Their work, their physical, you know, effort, the hishtadut, that was only secondary. And we see over here and throughout the Gemara, throughout the, you know, Tanah, we have so many of the big rabbis. Hillel was a woodchopper. Rabbi Yeshua was a blacksmith. Abba Chilkia was worked in plowing. Noach himself was he was into sewing. He was a Isha Adama. He was a master of the soil. Avraham, we know, was 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 like a shepherd. He had a flock. Yitzhak was a man of agriculture. He, it says that Yitzhak, you know, he had he sowed in the land. Yaakov also worked as a shepherd. Moshe also was Yisro shepherd. We have over here not only righteous people that tzaddikim, the leaders of the generation, were also did their physical, their physical hishtadlut. Uh, so we have to remember this very, very important concept. And that is that we, oh yes, we, it's very important that we need to do hishtadlut. We need to, it's a must, you have to do hishtadlut. Don't think, don't be one of those people who have a munam bitachon and I sit back. You have to do hishtadlut. How much hishtadlut? That's another question. That's for a different class. We have to see how much each person has to do. But to think that you don't have to do anything, we, we are, we're put in this world that we have to do. We have to do our effort. Now, after we do that effort, I'm talking about effort over here, spiritual effort and physical effort in this world and in the next world. Now, even if you put those efforts, you have sometimes that someone puts an effort and they're very successful. And so another person puts exact same effort, spiritual, physical, all aspects, and they're not successful. So the answer is what's going on up here. And the answer is very simple. Is God decided that this person will be successful and this person would not be successful? The, where it comes very, very problematic, and especially with earning money, is this results in shalom bayis, in marital, uh, you know, uh, disharmony, let's call it. There's this problem at a home. And a lot of times when people, you know, call me up and they have issues in the relationship, a lot of times it has to do because there's some sort of financial strains. In fact, that's one of the first questions that I usually ask. How is the panasa in the house? How's the money? And when I hear money is tight, then it makes all the sense. And a woman has to understand, specifically a woman, that if her husband is not bringing home, let's say the same level of pay that he used to, or he's not being able to support the family that I used to, it's not because he's a failure. He might be lazy, maybe, yeah, maybe not, but that's not for the wife to decide. It's because God made it that this person would not be successful. Yes, maybe he has to do the Ishtadut, but it causes so much, so much marital problems that it doesn't help the situation at all. It just makes it so much worse. You have to deal with all these situations in the right way. And I, I want to put this point specifically in this class because there's sometimes when you have, especially when you, when you speak about effort, you go and you say to your husband, ah, you see, you're not putting in enough effort. Or maybe sometimes it's the other way around. You're putting in too much effort. You're not spending enough time with me and the family and the kids. This is not the correct way to handle it. You have to go and you have to figure this is a very, very delicate situation and it, and it can blow up. It could blow up and cause tremendous amount of, of fights in a relationship that has to be dealt very, very carefully. So, what we have to realize is, yes, we have to do our ishtadut. Yes, we have to do our effort. But ultimately, 
It's not our effort that brings our success. It's what God wants to bring. God wants, God desires, that's what we're going to have. When the Jewish people got the man, from the, the food from heaven, we had some people that used to carry a little bit. And when they came home, they saw that they had, a, they had, a, they had the a right amount that they needed. And other people carried a tremendous amount. They did a tremendous amount of Ishtalut, but they came home, they only had the specific amount that they were allotted to. Meaning that it didn't matter how much Ishtalut they did, they still came back with the right, with the Omer size, the, what, the size that they needed to. So a very important aspect, and this is something we'll speak about, Bezad Hashem, in the coming classes, in regard to how much effort you need to do. There's a fine line. You can't go too much, and you can't go too little. With that, I want to bring a certain point that I wasn't sure if I was going to speak about it or not, uh, because I don't like speaking about, um, you know, usually you realize I don't speak too much about, uh, you know, current events. And especially I don't get into politics. But... There's something that's, you know, been getting a little bit, of, I feel, in my own opinion, a little bit out of control with this whole presidential election. And, um, and that is, like, I've met people, spoke to people who were going into anxiety over because Trump lost the election. Oh, we don't know yet. Whatever it is, it's going to happen. You know, I'm not even going to get to that part of it. But they were going crazy about it. That's it. You know, like it. I'm moving. I'm going to go to Canada. I'm moving to Israel. I'm moving. They become, you know, the, it's such a loss, to, you know, to the Jewish community. It's, a, you know, like, they're like, I'm done. You know, like, I can't. They go through so much, so much problems. And I, and I wish, I, I would wish I could give you some examples, but I don't want to call people out. But to the effect of how much this bothered them so much. Trump was their highest level. And I want to share with you the sort of analogy that my wife shared with me. It says you have a flashlight and you're shining that flashlight on the, on the wall. And you look at the wall is light. And you're looking at the wall and you'd be like, oh, okay, look at the light, look at the light, and you, it's so bright. But the, answer, the, the, the source of the light is not the wall. The source of the light is the flashlight. We have Trump, yes, Trump was great for the Jewish nation. And yes, I voted for Trump and, you know, whatever. It's, it, it really was a loss and I feel bad. But Trump was the light on the wall. It was God who was shining the light over there. Trump is not the reason that the Jewish people was, you know, like Israel was good and, and everything worked out and they kind of, whatever it was, Trump was not the reason. Yes, Trump was a messenger, Trump was a shleach, and we have a karat to and we're very grateful. And we should vote, that's what the, you know, the rabbis tell us, of who, you know, that, that Trump was good for us and we, we are sad that we're, we don't have him anymore. Or as of yet, we will see. But we can't lose focus of where this came from. This is not Trump that gave us this, this is God. And this, the, the real point that you have to think, if you're someone that's so troubled by this, you know, so passionate to over politics all of a sudden, you know, people, you know, are having debates in their families, are causing you know, so much fights. The question that you need to ask yourself, were you this passionate about Israel when you dove in Rosh Hashanah? Were you this passionate about other aspects when you're praying to God? Be like, I can't believe what they did, it's fraud, it's this, and this, this person's fraud, and it's that. You're going on and on, be like, relax a second. It's all from God, relax, it's nothing to do, it's not Trump, it's not Biden, it's not Bernie Sanders, even though he's out of the picture, it's not Hillary Clinton, it's not Obama, it doesn't matter, it's all God. And when we put so much faith on a leader, we're lessening our emunah. We're, yes, we have to do our hishadut, we have to do our voting. But after that, that's it, okay, move on. You know, it, you know, relax. People are, are, are moving to different countries, you know. <laughs> you have over here, the Democrats want to move out when, uh, when Trump was president. Now, you know, Democrats is here, all the Republicans want to move out. Relax. You know, <laughs> people like, get so obsessed over it that there's absolutely no reason for it. You're obsessing over the wrong thing. You want to obsess over something? Then pray to God. All right, instead of having a fight with your family or a fight with this and reading up all the news and how much swallowing it up and all the politics and everything that's going on, you know, stop for a second. That's not going to make a difference. First of all, it wouldn't make a difference because it doesn't matter what you know, but you could make a difference. And that is through spiritual hishtadlut. There's something that you could do, and that's to pray to God. The God, you know, Trump was a shleach for, for, for good news for Israel. So, so too, Biden can be a, a, a you know, a shleach for Israel. We have to pray for that. At the end of the day, it's all from God. Don't lose, don't lose focus. We are not focusing on the light on the wall. We're focusing on the flashlight, the source of the light. And with that, we'll open up with any uh, questions. Question number one we have here. As a person gets closer and closer to God, does that generally mean that less hishtadlut is necessary? 
So yes, in a certain sense, but we'll speak about that. There's a few classes that I would like to do. I'm not sure how much before I speak about how much effort we need to have. So we have to get a few certain important concepts out there before we speak about how much that. The, the, the way that I, I wanted to sort of break this down is number one, the need. Today was, was speaking about the need that you have to do Ishtadut. Many people feel that they don't have to do Ishtadut. So that, I think that's very, very wrong. Obviously, obviously there's levels. Some people have to do less. And we spoke about many stories where you had you know, you know, rabbis be doing barely any Ishtadut and because of that they were successful. And yes, that's when we, def we define about where the Ishtadut, where that line moves. But first step is to know that you need to do Ishtadut. Question number two. Some people try very hard financially and put a lot of effort, but things don't work, just don't work out. They know that Hashem is in control, but I think they don't put it into practice as well. When it's someone's close family members or parents who are suffering through it, it's through this, then how can the person deal with hearing about seeing someone close to them struggling like this? So the first thing that we have to understand when people go through struggle is that from somebody that's looking from an outside perspective, First of all, you can never judge anybody, ever. But especially because we're in an outside perspective, so you're not dealing with the stresses that they have. So when they're dealing with the stresses, it's very hard for them to think about it in an intellectual uh, you know, aspect. There's many emotions that come up. And when things like that come, they can't focus, even though they, they may know the, the aspect of emunah, they may know the aspect of Yishadu, but it's very hard for them to go and, and put that into, in, you know, into a certain order. And that's why, when do you need to work on emunah? When do you need to work on your level and how much you need to do and what you need to do? Not when you're in the situation. You have to work on it beforehand. You have to train your body, train your mind, train your emotions to be able to deal with the situations before it comes. In the army, you don't deal with the, uh, with, you know, with the enemy at the front lines. You train and you train and you train to the point that you don't have to think about it, that it becomes natural to you. So. Unfortunately, when people are going through sufferings, you know, the best is to try to prepare themselves, to work on themselves beforehand. So it's very, sometimes it's very difficult to put into practice. So a lot of times, what, when someone's going through these difficulties, it's, they don't need the reminder. Be like, I have more emuna. And be like, you, you know, like smack you across your face with your emuna. No, sometimes they just need a little bit of understanding, a little bit of a, a ear to listen to, or maybe, uh, you know, some, some of the positive emotion. It's not always the negative. Sometimes people cannot hear the negative. Hope I answered that question clearly. Okay, and that seemed to be the final question there. Is there, uh, if there's no any, any other questions, we will end off for tonight. All right, looks like uh, this is it. So, Chazak thank you all for joining.